In high school, a student interested in taking a part in rebuilding machines approached the CEO of Hewlett Packard and asked for some parts to help him complete a class project. Duly impressed, the CEO made arrangements for the student to get the parts. And years later, he was probably thrilled to be able to say that he took the time to do so, because that confident student who asked for the parts, well, that was Steve Jobs, a man who would go on to become the CEO of Apple Computers and a preeminent figure in the tech industry. Steve Jobs was born to two unmarried graduates in 1955. Curiously, this is just nine months before Microsoft founder Bill Gates. His parents gave him up for adoption, and Jobs was 30 years old and well in the midst of tech stardom before he learned about his birth parents, the Simpsons. Growing up, the only family he knew was his adoptive parents, a couple from Mountain View, California, who fostered his interest in taking apart and rebuilding machines. His father, Paul Jobs, was a machinist who taught Jobs about electronics from an early age. Working in the family garage, the two spent hours Always tinkering on projects. During those work sessions in the garage, Jobs' father taught him a lesson that has made its way into Apple's products of all shapes and sizes. Don't sacrifice any part of the design, no matter where it is on the product. Jobs later described this saying, When you're a carpenter making a beautiful chest of drawers, you're not going to use a piece of plywood on the back, even though it faces the wall and nobody will ever see it. You know it's there, so you're going to use a beautiful piece of wood on the back. For you to sleep well at night, the aesthetic, the quality, has to be carried all the way through. Though Jobs showed an early interest in mechanics and design, he did not show early promise in school. His mother had taught him to read as a toddler, but he was bored in school and often goofed off, a habit that frustrated one teacher to the point of bribing him to behave. This teacher saw potential in a young Jobs, and Jobs later credited Mrs. Hill with being one of the saints of his life. Jobs so excelled in that fourth grade class with Mrs. Hill that she skipped him over the fifth grade entirely, and he headed straight for middle school. This this jump ahead, though, it was pretty tough for him initially. He was bullied and he became a bit of a loner. Indeed, he disliked middle school so much that he told his parents that if he couldn't switch schools, he would just stop going to school altogether. In order to keep Jobs in school, the family moved from Mountain View to Los Altos, and Jobs settled into the Cupertino School District. It was here that he met and befriended Bill Fernandez, another student interested in electronics. Fernandez, well, he later played a critical role in the creation of Apple computers when he introduced Introduced Jobs to his neighbor, another electronics aficionado, and, well, someone you might have heard of. His name was Steve Wozniak, and we've actually got more on him, unsurprisingly, in a minute. By the time he entered high school, well, Jobs, he was already working at Hewlett Packard, where a cold call to the CEO had earned him a job offer. But while he was in high school, his interests, well, they began to diversify a bit. Jobs discovered a love for the classics and for literature in general. Dylan Thomas and Shakespeare were his particular favorites. During his senior year, Jobs was so excelling in English that he was able to take classes at Stanford. When it came time to attend, though, Jobs opted to attend Reed State in Oregon. But, well, that didn't really last very long. After only one semester, Jobs' previous his aversion to formal education reared its head and he dropped out. He continued dropping in on classes that interested him, but he wasn't earning any credits and he wasn't paying for anything. Interestingly, one of these classes that he dropped into, well, it greatly affected his future. This is something that he actually explained in his famous 2005 Stanford commencement address, something, by the way, which is well worth watching. If I had never dropped in on that single calligraphy course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. Despite being a college dropout, Jobs was able to secure a job with Atari computers in 1974. He worked as a tech, assisting the engineers who were doing the heavy-duty coding work. Jobs didn't have a lot of money at the time, and he was trying to scrape funds together to travel to India to study Eastern religion. Clearly, his interest in things outside of technology had stuck around. The head of Atari, Neil Bushnell, years later said he thought Jobs might have been saving money by actually living in the office. I'm not sure about this, but I think Steve was actually living there, so people used to complain that he 
didn't smell that well. I'd come in on the weekend and it'd be there. I'd come in late at night and it'd be there. The time at Atari also marked a key point in the friendship between Jobs and his old friend Steve Wozniak. Jobs was assigned to design a circuit board for the video game Breakout, and he approached Wozniak to help because Atari was offering a bonus if it could be designed using fewer chips. Jobs also needed the project completed in only four days. What Jobs didn't tell Wozniak was that Atari had offered Jobs a large bonus for using fewer chips, a bonus Jobs received and kept for himself, even though Wozniak did the majority of the work. When Wozniak found out about this lie ten years later, he's reported to have cried. But Wozniak, he didn't know of Jobs' deceit at the time, and the two, they continued experimenting with technology together. But there was a point where their tinkering was put on hold because Jobs' living in the office had finally saved him enough money to travel to India. He went to India in search of spiritual enlightenment, something that was rather in the fashion in the 60s and 70s. He did this trip on an incredibly tight budget. He slept on the street, he sweated on crowded buses, and he ate the bare minimum. He also must have eaten some pretty sketchy food, reportedly getting dysentery and losing 40 pounds. During this time, he was also meditating and learning about Zen Buddhism. He wanted to go to Tibet, but after his traveler's checks were stolen, he decided to head back home to the United States. When he got back home, he continued meditation, as well as another habit he'd picked up, and that would be the use of psychedelic drugs. Jobs, he was a big fan of LSD, a drug he'd tried in college and would credit with expanding his creativity and vision of the world. Taking LSD was a profound experience, one of the most important things in my life. LSD shows you there's another side to the coin, and you can't remember it when it wears off, but you know it. It reinforced my sense of what was important, creating great things instead of making money, putting things back into the stream of history and of human consciousness as much as I could. Back in the United States, Jobs had no money and lived in his parents' tool shed that he had converted into a bedroom. But he and Wozniak continued to work on computers, with Jobs convincing Wozniak that at least one of Wozniak's early products was sellable. Wozniak had built a product known as a blue box that could mimic the tones of a telephone system and essentially trick a phone into making a free long distance call. With technology today, we don't really think twice about calling someone on the other side of the planet, but in the 1970s, this was a big deal. Now, as you might have guessed, yes, the these blue boxes were totally illegal, but they did still sell well. Yep, Steve Jobs' first business was absolutely selling illegal devices that allowed you to make long-distance phone calls for free. Now, the next brainchild that Wozniak had, well, it was much more legitimate. It was a product that would become the Apple One. In 1976, Jobs suggested selling it, and he and Wozniak officially started Apple Computers. The company was first run out of Jobs' parents' garage, and most of their customers, they were hobbyists. Well, enough computer hobbyists were laying out money for the Apple One that Jobs and Wozniak, well, they had cash in their pockets. Jobs began searching for investors, and Wozniak, he kept designing. In 1977, which was just one year after the company launched, they put out a new version of their computer called the Apple II. This time it had color graphics and was much more user-friendly, allowing it to be used outside of just the hobbyist market. They sold $3 million of the Apple II in their first year alone, but this figure well, it was about to become dwarfed. Two years later, they had sold two 200 million dollars worth. But again, this seemingly huge number was about to be dwarfed yet again. In 1980, only four years after their launch, Jobs and Wozniak, they went public. By the end of Apple's first day of public trading, the company was worth an astounding 1.2 billion dollars. Steve Jobs, he was only 25 years old. During the nascent years of Apple, Jobs was dealing with much personal turmoil. His long-time on-again, off-again girlfriend, Chrisanne Brennan, had moved in with him, and while she got pregnant, Jobs was, by all accounts, not really thrilled about this news. He later told Brennan, I never wanted to ask that you get an abortion, I just didn't want to do that. Brennan had been offered a job at Apple, but given Jobs' reaction to her pregnancy, she did not want to take it. She left him and their house and began working as a cleaner. Despite asking for support from Jobs, he did not provide any support for his child until a paternity test confirmed that he was the father. Even then, despite his company being worth over a billion dollars, he was only required to provide $500 a month in child support. Despite these early problems, Lisa and Jobs they eventually reconciled, and Lisa even lived with Jobs during her high school years. 
She then attended Harvard, and today she works as a writer in New York City. Though it took him years to admit it, Jobs actually named one of Apple's early products after his daughter. But the Lisa computer, it wasn't as successful as the Apple II had been. This failure, it was followed by another, the Apple III, which again failed to live up to expectations. And not just Jobs' expectations, but everyone's. Despite Apple being Jobs' company, the fact that it was public meant that the Apple board had the power to oust him as CEO. And, well, they did just that in 1983. They didn't really fire him, though. They just sent him to Siberia. I mean, not literally Siberia, of course, but the office he went to was referred to as Siberia because it was so out of the way that it was basically exile. Now, most Apple employees, they were probably pleased to see him go. He was notoriously difficult to deal with, and a former Apple employee described Jobs' attitude toward work as management by character character assassination. By 1985, well, he was tired of hanging out in Siberia and decided to leave the company that he had founded and start a brand new one. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating, Job said of this experience. I even thought about running away from the valley, but something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did, and so I decided to start over. He started Next Computer Company, which brought its first product to market in 1988. That computer, though, well, it had a price tag of $10,000, a price way higher than most consumers were willing to pay. Needless to say, it did not sell well. This wasn't a good start for Jobs' fledgling company, and so he decided to shift the company to building software. But Jobs' focus, well, it was drawn elsewhere towards something rather unusual for him, and that was the movies. In 1986, he bought Pixar from George Lucas. As part of his dream for this company, Jobs wanted to be responsible for the first movie done entirely with computer animation. It took four years, but eventually he achieved that dream. Well, that movie, it was Toy Story. It was released in November of 1995, and it became a favorite film for both kids and adults. And to this day, it maintains a perfect 100% score on Rotten Tomatoes. A year after the release of Toy Story, it was even better news. Jobs took Pixar public, and in something of a deja vu situation, his shares were worth $1 billion after the first day of trading. The first day of trading, well, it was the first in a string of good days for Jobs. Shortly after Pixar went public, Apple put out the welcoming mat for Steve Jobs to return. When he returned to Apple in 1997, the company it was operating at a loss, and they needed Jobs' vision and drive back at the helm. Apple also announced that they would buy the struggling next computer company, turning a previous failure of Jobs into a success. Jobs, he triumphantly returned to the company that he had founded. The company wanted him to bring Apple to the forefront of the personal computer market. Within months of his return, Jobs, he was named CEO. He paid himself a salary of only $1 a year, and in exchange brought both business acumen and creative design ideas to the company. He negotiated a financial deal with Microsoft that brought Apple the cash flow that it needed to stay afloat, while also helping Microsoft avoid the perception that they were a monopoly. Then he envisioned the big idea that helped bring Apple back to profitability in its own right right and that was the iMac. It was in 1998 that Apple released the brightly colored egg-shaped desktop computer called the iMac. The iMac is even still made today, although it looks rather different. From the iMac forward, Apple and Jobs, they just couldn't miss. They revolutionized the way people listened to music in 2001 with the iPod, and then the way they communicated in 2007 with the iPhone, and then they were pioneers in the tablet market with the 2010 release of the iPad. Jobs once said of Apple, we started out to get a computer in the hands of everyday people, and we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. Today, well, it's nearly impossible to walk down the street without seeing someone with an Apple-made device in their hands. And through all these years of professional success, Jobs still found the time to focus on his family. In 1986, his adoptive mother was diagnosed with lung cancer, and this, for the first time, prompted Jobs' interest in his biological parents. When his adoptive mother passed away, Jobs spoke to his father about contacting his birth parents, whose names he had on documents from his parents. Jobs met both his birth mother, Joanna Scheibel, and his biological sister, Mona Simpson, shortly 
after his adoptive mother died. Scheibel, then Jobs' birth father, had divorced in 1962 when the Syrian migrant opted to return to Syria after earning his PhD. When Jobs was introduced to Mona, she was still searching for their father. Jobs joined her in the search, and what they found out, well, it was quite surprising. The father, well, he was not in Syria working in academia. Rather, their father was living in California and running a restaurant. Incredibly, Jobs said he had met the man Mona identified as their father. He'd even shaken his hands and eaten in his restaurants. But he had never known he was his father. Jobs, though, he had no interest in getting to know his father as he'd gotten to know his mother and Mona, explaining his decision by saying, I learned a little bit about him and I didn't like what I learned. While getting to know his birth family, Jobs also decided to start a family of his own. In 1989, Jobs gave a lecture at Stanford Business School, and he was riveted by a woman in the front row. She was right there in the front row, in the lecture hall, and I couldn't take my eyes off her. I kept losing my train of thought and started feeling a little giddy. This is the feeling that Jobs described when he first met Laureen Powell. Laureen Powell was an MBA student at Stanford, and Jobs struck up a conversation with her after the lecture. He invited her out to dinner that night, and the two, they began a romantic relationship. A Zen Buddhist monk presided over their wedding ceremony at Yosemite National Park in 1991, and over the next seven years, the couple had three children. They remained married until Jobs' death in 2011. Amid all of these successes of the early years of the 21st century, Jobs was not free from worry, and, well, neither was Apple Computers. In 2003, Jobs received the news all of us dread. That he had cancer. His doctors had found a cancerous tumor in his pancreas, and though operable, it was a rare form of cancer. Well, Jobs, he refused to listen to his doctors and have an operation right away. Instead, he opted to explore other options, namely veganism and acupuncture. In 2004, with these alternative methods not improving his condition, Jobs opted to have the tumor surgically removed. Several cancer specialists have since said that that period of waiting may have cost Jobs years of his life. In 2005, Jobs gave a commencement address at Stanford University that frankly and poignantly discussed his thoughts on life and death now that he had to confront the matter head on. The 15-minute speech reflected on three moments in his life that helped him get to where he was, and in telling those stories, he imparted a message to the graduates and to the world to do what you love, remember you are going to die, and to trust your inner voice. Not to follow your heart. He closed the speech with simple words from the 1970s countercultural magazine, The Whole Earth Catalog. Stay hungry. Stay foolish. The commencement address struck a chord around the world. It has been viewed over 27 million times on YouTube and serves as an inspiration and a stark reminder of our limited time on Earth. It was a speech that truly every human can relate to, given by a man whose mind and drive were far more extraordinary than most humans. Jobs continued to work at Apple following the surgery, but in 2008, people began asking questions about his health as his appearance began to show his illness. He was gaunt, graying, and just didn't seem healthy. The company continued to explain this away. After questions were raised at one tech event, Apple attributed his appearance to a simple bug and said he was taking antibiotics. Shareholders, they continued to worry, and in 2009, the truth came out. Jobs was suffering from ill health and ended up having a liver transplant. Tim Cook, Apple's head of worldwide sales, filled in as CEO while Jobs was recovering from the procedure. Jobs later managed to return to his post and continued to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of Apple, with his prognosis being described as excellent. But unfortunately, this was not to be. Only a year and a half after returning to the helm of Apple, Jobs had to step down as CEO. In providing his reasons to the company board, he stated, I've always said, if there ever came a day when I could no longer meet my duties and expectations as Apple's CEO, I would be the first to let you know. Unfortunately, that day has come. Though he stepped down as CEO and handed Tim Cook the reins of the company, Jobs did serve as chairman of the Apple board. Sadly, it was only for six weeks that he would work for Apple in this capacity. On the 4th of October 2011, Jobs lost consciousness. He stayed at home, surrounded by his family, and died of complications from his pancreatic cancer on October the 5th. 
he was only 56 years old. The world greeted the death of this technology icon with shock and grief. California's governor issued a proclamation for a Steve Jobs Day to be celebrated, and the companies with which he was associated issued statements about the life, creativity, and innovation of their founder and partner. His family held a private funeral, the details of which are still unknown. In 56 years of life and 30 years in the tech industry, Steve Jobs was at the helm of guiding the world into the future. He was certainly a difficult man to deal with, but he was an innovator, a businessman, and a visionary whose ideas shaped the world in which we live today. So I really hope you enjoyed that biography of Steve Jobs. If you did, please do subscribe to our channel. We put out brand new biographies just like this every Monday and every Thursday, so subscribe for more. Also check out some of our other biographies over there on the right. If you like this, you probably like those long form looks into people's life. Check them out. They're, uh, they're worth watching loads more on the channel itself. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.